Hello, and welcome to the Political Institutions and Political Economy Pipe Workshop at the Bedrosian Center here in the Price School at the University of Southern California. I'm Jeff Jenkins, the director of the Bedrosian Center and the Pipe Collaborative. Our workshop speaker today is Michael Olson. Michael is an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science at Washington University in St. Louis, where he is also a faculty affiliate of the Center for the Study of Race, Ethnicity, and Equity. His broad interests include representation, legislative politics, and political parties in the United States. His research focuses on the relationship between electoral and legislative institutions and legislative representation in the US using observational data from across history and levels of government. Particular interests include the, the effects of competitive party systems, the impacts of electoral and legislative reforms, and the importance of the elective franchise. Michael's presentation today is entitled Restoration and Representation, Legislative Consequences of Black Disfranchisement in the American South, 1879 to 1916. Following the presentation, we'll have a formal discussion, David Bateman from Cornell University to provide some comments. During Michael's talk, if you have any questions, please type them in the chat or Q&A box. I'll be monitoring questions as the talk goes on. And without further ado, I give you Michael Olson. Great. Thank you, Jeff, so much for that very kind introduction. Uh, I'm very excited to be here uh, and uh, to share some of this work with you uh, that I've been working on for longer than I'd care to admit on the relationship between Black disfranchisement in the South and legislative representation. Uh, so to, to just start, I want to set the stage a little bit with uh, thinking about Reconstruction. So the period immediately after the Civil War. Uh, and at this point, African-Americans in the South gained the right to vote really for the first time in US history. Um, and not only do they gain the right to vote, they use it. They elect African-American representatives, they uh, um, enact public policies that are more in line with their preferences than the sort of uh, white only electorate had done before. And they become full participating members in the sort of body politic of the South at this time. And uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, this doesn't make whites in the South uh, terrifically happy. And so once federal troops are removed from the South at the end of Reconstruction, we enter a period called redemption. Uh, this image is called, of course, he wants to vote the Democratic ticket. It was published in Harper's and sort of emblematic of this period where things like violence, fraud, intimidation, coercion were used to sort of uh, uh, sap the political power of African-Americans. But importantly, these were informal methods uh, of disfranchisement or or at least uh, um, yeah, reducing the political power of African-Americans. They weren't sort of formal laws, rules, things like this uh, uh, that we're sort of more familiar with. That took a little longer. That took until about the uh, um, mid to late 1880s, running through uh, um, the early 19 knots. And that's when we get this period that I'm gonna focus on today called redemption. Uh, and this is when we get uh, the things that you sort of learn about in history class, poll taxes, literacy tests, et cetera that really put into law, even if they don't specify that they're targeted at African-Americans, these are functionally laws that remove African-Americans from the electorate wholly, completely, entirely. Um, and so ultimately what I'm gonna focus on today is the consequences of these laws, these rules, this formal disfranchisement for state legislative representation and legislative behavior in the South. And this you can pitch this as sort of adjudicating between competing claims that are sort of out there in the literature. Um, on the one hand, we have V.O. Key, uh, the sort of Southern politics person we all know and read in graduate school, uh, who claims essentially that um, before these formal laws, uh, really African-Americans' political power had been more or less taken away through these things like violence, intimidation, and fraud. Essentially, these laws, in his view, aren't that important. They're just sort of institutionalizing the status quo of low African-American participation. On the other hand, we get uh, people like Morgan Couser and others pointing out that a lot of political capital gets expended uh, passing these laws. You know, if African American influence in politics is so low uh, and so insignificant, why is it that states are sort of uh, taking on legal risk uh, and and sort of tempting fate to put these things in their state constitutions and statute books? And so we get sort of a little a little disagreement in the literature over the importance of these formal rules that remove African-Americans from the Southern electorate. Again, late 1880s through the, the um, early 
Importantly, uh, what I'm going to do in this paper that I think distinguishes it from, from some other work is I'm going to focus on state legislative representation. Um, there's been existing work that looks at this period in Congress, but state legislatures are really where uh, these debates are being had. It's where sort of the solid South is born in some sense. It's where uh, debates over disfranchisement occur. And ultimately focusing on Congress, you sort of have to grapple with the fact that the South is participating in a national party system, a national legislature. Focusing on the states, we get a little bit more in-depth, a little bit more nuanced understanding of what politics look like in these places and times. So that's gonna be, I think, one innovation of this project. Uh, just to preview what I'm gonna uh, hopefully convince you of uh, going forward, I'm gonna use some original state legislative roll call data that I've, that I've uh, scraped from uh, digitized legislative journals and sort of a, a panel design uh, to show that uh, the formal institutional disfranchisement of African-Americans certainly worsens that representation of African-Americans in at least some states. And then even in places that are sort of all Democrats all the time, even before these formal laws are passed, uh, it appears to sort of mute differences between more and less black areas and sort of contributes to the development of the solid South in that way. So I wanna start by, by thinking a little bit about legislative representation in this time and place and why we should even sort of ask this question. Because uh, on the one hand, there's a lot of features of this context, Southern state legislatures and sort of final decades of the, of the 19th century that might make one think that, that really dyadic representation isn't gonna be uh, occurring to begin with. So um, on the one hand, these are really unprofessional legislatures uh, in a lot of ways, uh, unprofessional, non-professional, you pick, um, all true probably. Um, legislators aren't serving uh, in most cases, even multiple terms, usually it's sort of one and done. Um, the, you know, it's just not a, a context where you'd expect great attentiveness from legislators to their constituents. Um, and on the, on the other hand, too, this is a context where a lot of states are already one party government. We think sort of theoretically that parties facilitate representation by, by sort of clarifying choices for voters and, and organizing legislative activity. But I just wanted to, to highlight some recent work um, uh, on the one hand, pointing out that even in sort of the earliest years of the American Republic, when, when politics was about as elite an affair as it could get, there's still some evidence that legislators cared about what their constituents thought. And that recent work, uh, uh, Devin Coey's uh, excellent book, some work by myself and Jim Snyder, showing that in one party settings, you can still get dyadic representation. It may not be all the time. It may not be you know, uh, um, pervasive, but it can happen at least. So we've got some sort of reason to believe that, yeah, maybe in this time period, there's some di dyadic representation going on. The other thing I want to note and I think this is a key sort of distinguishing thing between the, the key and Kauser arguments I showed you before is that disfranchisement likely changed who the median voter was. So if we're thinking in sort of the simplest sort of spatial framework understanding of, of representation, we would sort of need disfranchisement to change who the median voter is uh, by removing African-Americans from the electorate um, in order to expect really a change in, in the behavior of legislators. And so uh, one thing I'll talk about a little bit more going forward is that Yes, in this time period, sort of, there's ample reason to believe that the median African American and the median white in the electorate would have had different preferences, and so you should see a change in the median voter there uh, by removing African Americans. And the other thing to highlight is that even in spite of all the fraud and violence and things that African Americans were facing uh, up until these laws were passed, these laws still sort of take the possibility of African-American voting down to zero. It goes from some, some positive possibility to zero, essentially. Uh, um, and I just wanna highlight this using this quote from Benjamin Tillman, sometime governor, sometime senator from South Carolina, speaking at the South Carolina Constitutional Convention in 1895, where uh, the sort of state's final uh, ultimate disfranchisement, disfranchising laws are passed. And importantly, at this point, South Carolina already has really low rates of black voting. They passed a, a you know multi-box law, a sort of literacy test, basically, uh, uh, almost a decade earlier. African Americans are not voting in large numbers, but as this quote shows, there remains this concern that if it's even possible that African Americans could vote, if it's if it's not impossible, essentially, that some uh, white politicians might want to recruit African-Americans and, and essentially turn them into pivotal voters between white factions. There's this concern that unless white, unless, excuse me, African-American voting is all the way down to zero, 
that there's still a problem. And so I just want to note that that these these disfranchising laws I'm talking about here really do, uh, um, even if African Americans aren't voting in large numbers, they can't vote afterwards, uh, um, sort of definitively. So uh, what exactly am I talking about uh, when thinking about disfranchisement? These are the sort of uh, uh, years that I'm gonna think about Southern states as having formally disfranchised African-Americans. And I wanna highlight a few things about this table. The first and probably the most important is that for my purposes, I'm considering disfranchisement to have sort of taken effect when the state legislature takes its first steps towards disfranchising African-Americans. So you'll note the activity column, everything starts with legislature verb. Um, and essentially, uh, this is because, you know, my concern is that African, or excuse me, the state legislatures should sort of be able to anticipate the removal of African Americans from the electorate, should know who, what the sort of electorate that they're going to face next time is. And so that's why I'm sort of coding it at this moment, not when the sort of constitution is passed or, or something along those lines. Um, overwhelmingly, uh, these are sort of changes to state constitutions, either amendments or, or whole new constitutions that are passed. Uh, Tennessee is a not notable example where it's it's sort of just by statute. And ultimately, the other thing I want to point out is that most of these states do most of the things that we've heard about, like poll taxes, literacy tests, uh, uh, grandfather clauses, things like this. Um, they're usually passing sort of a bundle uh, of policies that are collectively designed to uh, um, empower local election officials to remove African-Americans from the electorate. And it's sort of the, the overwhelming um, a theme here. And I'm happy to talk more about what specific states do, but ultimately I'm saying after, after and including the sort of year coded in this table, that state had disfranchised African-Americans. So in order to assess the uh, consequences of uh, disfranchisement for the way that legislators are behaving, I'm going to require some measure of legislate, legislators' uh, activity. And so I'm gonna use roll call voting, in this case, uh, from the lower chamber specifically of the state legislatures of the former Confederacy. So I have 10 states uh, omitting Texas um, due to um, just concerns about the sort of scrapability of the, of the journals. Uh, I'm gonna take 10 sessions per state. Uh, so we're covering about 20 years per state, straddling disfranchisement in that state. So looking back at this table, essentially 10 years before and 10 years after and including uh, uh, the years that you see coded here. So the state samples are, are gonna differ uh, uh, temporarily. Uh, ultimately, this, this gives me about 7,000 unique legislators participating in about 19,000 unique roll call votes uh, uh, in this time period. And what I'm doing here uh, is taking sort of digitized legislative journals. Uh, thankfully, most I didn't have to digitize myself from either this Law Library Microfilm Consortium, Hathi Trust, uh, and then a few that I that I did digitize myself from the uh, Law Library or New York State Library or other places like that to sort of fill in the gaps. But this is a this is a complete collection for each of these states of the uh, legislative journals and therefore uh, the roll call votes. Just to give you a sense of what this looks like, this is from the Virginia House of Delegates and I believe 1901, uh, something that we're definitely not talking about anymore. Uh, the creation of Confederate monuments in courthouse squares in Virginia. Um, and so this passes fairly overwhelmingly, as you can see. But um, aside from being an interesting example uh, um, to connect this back to today, uh, this is essentially the data that I'm using. These This sort of block of yays and nays are being pulled out and turned into the sort of big roll call matrix of zeros and ones that that those who are familiar with, with working with congressional data, for example, would, would find familiar. So though, I need to go from that, that big matrix of zeros and ones that I have for each state and turn that into something usable, something that I can use to sort of measure changes in legislators' behavior uh, with uh, the coming of disfranchisement. And to do that, I'm just gonna um, do sort of standard uh, calculation of ideal points using sort of Bayesian IRT model, the ideal package in R for those of you who are interested uh, to get sort of this low dimensional uh, uh, sort of one number that captures the legislator's roll call record uh, relative to his peers. Um, and uh, uh, some details, uh, what I'm going to do is every legislator gets a single ideal point for the course of their career that is just sort of necessitated by uh, um, the nature of the data. And I'm going to use multi-term legislators, folks who serve multiple times, uh, to sort of glue together the different sessions within a state so that we can compare, say, a legislator in Virginia in 
1895 to a legislator in Virginia in 1905 and say like, yes, these folks are similar or different uh, um, without, without worrying too much about that comparability. And then what I'm gonna do uh, to sort of provide some meaning to this, um, because ultimately this is just sort of spitting out a number that doesn't have a, a whole lot of uh, contextual meaning uh, without it being applied. And I'm gonna use sort of uh, party or factional or, or regional labels that I've collected to sort of figure out who's who, who's voting together, who's, who's uh, voting differently and figure out how this sort of maps onto or doesn't map onto uh, the preferences of, of African-American whites in the South at this time. And so just to give you a sense of what this looked like, I'll start with the sort of easy case. These four states, uh, Florida, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Virginia, uh, all, all are nice in that they look kind of like uh, Congress today or, or Congress anytime. Essentially, you've got Democrats, you've got Republicans, and they're not voting like each other. They're voting you know, together within party, against each other, across parties. Uh, um, you know, Tennessee here is like a really nice, crisp example of this. Uh, and then just sort of uh, from the historical record, we see you can sort of make out the, the populace, this little gray uh, uh, bit in North Carolina, and, and it's a little harder to see in Virginia, are sort of falling in between the Democrats and Republicans right where the sort of historical record tells us they should be. And so in these states, uh, we can say pretty clearly, uh, I've oriented this such that Republicans are sort of associated with higher values, and, and that's the sort of end of the ideolo ideological spectrum that is going to be uh, better for African Americans are more in line with African American preferences. You know, at this time period, African Americans are overwhelmingly voting for the Republican Party. The Democratic Party is sort of the main vehicle for white supremacy in the South at this time. And so, in these states, it's fairly clear, sort of, uh, uh, which end is which as far as mapping this onto um, African American preferences. More complicated are states that are sort of all Democrats all the time. And you can see just by the, the sort of relative size of the, the blue blobs on, on these plots that, that this is sort of the, uh, a lot of Democrats and re really sort of swamping uh, um, any, other, any other group, whether it be Democrats or the sort of more uh, uh, populist or, or agrarian folks. And so what I've done for these states is I've taken, uh, virtually all these states have some number of people who I'm calling sort of agrarians just to put one nice label on it. And this is either the populist party, the greenback party earlier in sort of the, the early 1880s uh, in Arkansas, the agricultural wheel uh, has candidates. And I'm sort of lumping all these folks into a label called agrarians and I'm putting those on the left. Um, this is partially just because it's it allows me to be consistent across states. Um, and also as I'll discuss, I think it's at least the closest approximation to, to uh, aligning things with, with black preferences. Um, but you can see in these states uh, um, that sort of pattern where, where the populists or agrarians are always to the left. And the Republicans uh, on this slide, at least, are sort of uh, hanging out in the middle, kind of between them, at least in Louisiana and Arkansas. Um, in, in Mississippi, it's a little clearer even uh, the way that African-American preferences align because Republicans are off to the right. Um, South Carolina is a little bit of an exception because uh, there are, uh, I was unable to find any party labels. Um, but just to be clear, most of these party labels are sort of taken from newspapers and things like that. Some are from official state sources. Um, South Carolina, it's, it's really all Democrats. Um, and so there I've split it by region of the state, basically the Piedmont, the more towards the Appalachian, the, the northwest corner of the state versus the sort of southeast half of the state um, that, that I'm calling the low country. And you can see the sort of uh, cleavage that lines there. So ultimately, when interpreting these, it's important to note that the sort of more populist more sort of poor white sort of preference alignment is to the left, whereas the sort of more conservative side of things is going to be uh, to the right. And just to, to provide a little context for why I do this, it's this nice quote from uh, C. Van Woodward's Origins of the New South, where he essentially notes that... Uh, um, it was, it was sort of poor whites, the more populist the end of, of the ideological spectrum at this time, who ended up being the sort of highest demanders for Jim Crow laws. They were in direct economic competition with African-Americans, and that this sort of induced the, uh, that, that it was actually poor whites who might have been you know, economic, uh, um, uh, in economic alignment with African-Americans who ultimately demand these sort of uh, sort of social control and segregation, whereas, and that this, this drove African-Americans towards an alignment with the sort of more conservative uh, end of, of the ideological spectrum among Democrats. Um, I, I just want to note, this is like complicated. Uh, um, 
uh, populists at various points are sort of trying to create biracial coalitions, and that very much complicates this story. Usually they fall apart pretty definitively. Um, and so uh, I don't want to make as strong claims for these sort of so-called Democrat dominated states about the extent to which my results will apply or will be sort of immediately, obviously indicative of a, a shift in representation of black interests. But I think at least aligning them this way gives us some, some consistent baseline by which to evaluate the results. So how do I come up with those results? Um, so what I'm going to do is, is estimate a, a fairly straightforward uh, to a fixed effects panel model where the outcome is going to be each legislator's ideal point estimate, uh, which again is, is constant within a legislator's career over time. But, uh, um, and so everything's going to be identified off of sort of uh, turnover, legislative turnover. Uh, and then I'm going to interact. The main thing I care about is this interaction between an indicator for disfranchisement in the state, which applies to every county in the state at once, right? Uh, everywhere sort of has the law of disfranchisement applying after a certain point in time. Interacted with the, the African-American share of the population in a given legislative district. And I should note too, just that legislative districts are overwhelmingly either counties or combinations of counties. So that, that sort of uh, facilitates um, doing this accurately. Um, and so this, this uh, lets us say essentially what the impact of disfranchisement ought to be on the electorate in a district, right? Uh, um, in an all white district, for example, where black black person is zero, um, there, there almost mechanically can't be a dyadic effect of black disfranchisement. You're, you, there are no African-Americans to remove. The median voter has in theory sort of stayed the same or moved very slightly. Um, there can of course be aggregate effects, um, but, but those are sort of taken away by the year fixed effects here. Um, uh, the other thing I want to mention uh, really specifically is that I'm going to estimate this separately by state. I, I sort of uh, mentioned that I'm able to bridge across time within a state, but absent uh, um, sort of all these state legislatures voting on the same thing at any point, which they really don't, at least not enough, um, this, the ideal point estimates are not going to be comparable across states. And, and again, these plots should sort of make that clear, right? Uh, um, we've got sort of Republicans in different places, and certainly these states, the the sort of ideological uh, cleavage is not going to be the same as it is in, in these Democrat dominated states. So I'm going to estimate this separately by state. I'll interpret everything separately by state. Everything is separately by state. Um, uh, and then we do have the, the two way fixed effects to sort of soak up hopefully any uh, time invariant district characteristics and, and sort of common shocks from year to year. So what, what I'm going to focus on just to be clear again is the coefficient beta on this interaction. That's sort of what I care about and that's going to capture the difference in the impact of disfranchisement in an all black relative to an all white district, right? That's, that's the sort of way you can, you can think about this, this coefficient. So I showed you the table of, of disfranchisement impact when, when it sort of goes into effect in each state. Here's the other piece of my sort of independent variable, the right-hand side of that equation, the distribution of black population share. This map is in countless books or version of this map. Uh, and you can see sort of uh, um, what you'd expect, the, the Mississippi Delta, uh, the black belt sort of running across Alabama, Georgia, up into South Carolina, right? And this is sort of just showing you essentially where, where larger proportions of African-Americans lived. And in these darker places, that's where we'd expect disfranchisement to sort of bite the most to have the, the biggest effect on, on sort of the median voter uh, in those places. So what I'm gonna do here is plot uh, each of these, um, state's results, again, all, each state from separate regressions. Uh, and I just put up there the, the standard deviation of the outcomes. We can help contextualize uh, uh, the results a little bit. They're all close to one uh, as a function of the, the roll call scaling uh, to create the ideal point estimates. But essentially, what, uh, what do we see? We see in, in six to 10 states, uh, significant consequences of disfranchisement on sort of legislative behavior. Uh, focusing on the, the states of two-party competition, Florida, North Carolina, Tennessee, Virginia, Three of those four have, have pretty significant consequences uh, uh, for roll call voting, which is what you'd expect if disfranchisement is removing African-Americans who were voting for Republicans from the electorate, such that those places are now going to be basically the leftover whites electing Democrats, right? We're sort of shifting away from Republic, a Republican roll call voting record to a Democratic roll call voting record. Um, in the other states, uh, Alabama, Arkansas, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, South Carolina, 
um, we see a, a bit more mixed, but still on balance, some evidence that disfranchisement is moving uh, uh, relatively um, representatives of more black districts sort of towards the more populist end of, of the ideological spectrum, sort of away from that more conservative uh, end of the ideological spectrum. And, and again, you know, if we're willing to posit that the populist end of the spectrum is worse for African-Americans, the sort of end that's demanding Jim Crow laws and things like that, this would also be constitute evidence of worse representation for African-Americans uh, in those places. Uh, I just saw, just to answer this, um, since I saw it, um, uh, John, does the rest, uh, regression include a non-interacted uh, disfranchisement term? It doesn't because it's soaked up by the year fixed effects um, because it's estimated separately by state. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll show, I, I do estimate it without the fixed effects. So you can kind of see the base term and it doesn't really change the, the coefficients of the interaction all that much um, too. So I'm happy to talk through that. But um, uh, what I want to point out first, uh, just to sort of <laughs> explain away one, one of these null findings a little bit in Georgia, um, this is really uh, an expected null in some sense. Georgia has a, a cumulative poll tax that's adopted right on the heels of reconstruction in 1877. And uh, it's sort of devastatingly effective at, at removing African Americans from the electorate. And this later reform that I'm looking at in sort of uh, uh, you know sort of 1905 to 1908 uh, period is really held by historians to be sort of a campaign ploy uh, more than anything else. And there really weren't that many African Americans to remove from the electorate at this point. Um, for some other states, uh, um, you know, Alabama, Mississippi, we we get these these significant facts. Arkansas, you know, not quite significant, but but almost in South Carolina, we sort of see a similar shift towards that more uh, in that state, the sort of more Piedmont populist, uh, um, poor white end of the ideological spectrum. So just to, to focus on these Democrat dominated states a little bit, what I've done in these plots is just, um, uh, is, these are just really simple scatter plots of, of black population share on the X axis and the ideal point estimates on, on the Y. So, so this is sort of a, uh, without statistical control version of, of what I just showed you. And what the estimates were showing is the difference in the slopes between these lines, essentially the slope of the post minus the slope of the pre. Um, and, and what I wanna emphasize is just that overwhelmingly, except in states where nothing really happens like Georgia and Louisiana, the lines are getting flatter uh, in the sort of post disfranchisement period. Meaning that the sort of differences in roll call voting in more and less black uh, uh, areas of these states are sort of being diminished or, or suppressed with uh, disfranchisement. And so uh, given that a lot of the historical accounts of, of these states in this time period reflects sort of battles between sort of big planners and, and the hill country sort of small, uh, poor white farmer type folks, um, I think this is interesting, uh, maybe suggestive, you know, it requires a little bit more um, reading of the tea leaves maybe uh, to think about um, this as sort of contributing to, to the development of the solid South um, by suppressing these regional differences within a state. Yeah, Jeff. Uh, so are, are these just state house districts? You look at state senates as well? Yeah. No, I don't look at state senates, okay. just state houses. Are those data as available in terms of roll call votes? Sorry. You know, so when you're going through the, the, the books themselves yep. right, to, to scrape these things, are, they, are those Senate votes? available as well yeah yeah you could use senate votes i use houses just because it um uh, would give a little more data and the districts are cleaner generally because they're they're in most states just a county is a district um whereas it gets a little fussier with senates um yeah. uh but yeah the senate data is in principle uh uh collectible in the same way that i did the houses okay so in, in, anyway i just i think it's this plot's nice and that it shows sort of what's happening sort of in the regression, this flattening of the slope between, between regions. So one question I, I often get with um, this project is sort of what about the poor whites? Because uh, people note correctly that in uh, these debates over, over disfranchisement and passing these new constitutions and laws, uh, really there was consensus uh, among just about everyone that African-Americans ought to be removed from the electorate. Uh, the real point of contention was how many whites were acceptable collateral damage or even desired collateral damage, uh, essentially how many um, uh, poor whites who, who might otherwise be inclined to vote for a party other than the Democrats, you know, ought, ought they to sort of uh, catch up in this process too. So what I want to do to examine the extent to which uh, um, 
this is about black disfranchisement specifically and not disfranchisement more generally is to put in a few other measures that capture um, these other dynamics. So first for each state, I'm gonna add in an interaction between disfranchisement and the percent illiterate irrespective of race uh, in a district. So every state uses at least something that, that deals with literacy, um, whether it's a specific literacy test or, or a Australian ballot that you have to sort of be able to read or, or something else. Um, and so if this was truly just about removing sort of illiterate voters, we ought to see that sort of, sort of uh, um, nix the, the effect on, on uh, percent black. And then I'm also gonna include uh, percent greenback uh, vote share for, for states that disfranchise uh, between 1880 and 1892. Uh, this is uh, from the 1880 presidential election. And then for states that disfranchise after 1892, percent populist, um, which uh, there's a populist candidate for president in 1892. And these are both gonna capture this sort of like agrarian discontent uh, um, that, that uh, happened in a lot of the poorer whiter areas of the South. And that was in many cases, an explicit target of disfranchisement to sort of suppress this and consolidate power within the democratic party. And so just showing the results, I think um, my takeaway from this is that uh, overwhelmingly in the states where percent black was significant before, it's still significant after you include these things. Uh, a few exceptions, South Carolina, uh, Arkansas um, get sort of, uh, sort of uh, taken away, but in none of these cases are these other measures that I've put in significant. Um, and so it's not as if we're seeing like, oh, when we include percent literate, that's the thing that pops. That's what actually is sort of dictating how uh, uh, legislative politics is changing. It seems like, no, in fact, this was about black disfranchisement specifically. Um, thinking uh, a little bit more about uh, how this uh, disfranchisement was used to sort of construct the solid South and to consolidate power within the Democratic Party. I'm gonna run the exact same model uh, that I did before, but swap out the ideal point estimate outcome variable for just an indicator for district elected a Democrat. Um, and uh, these are the states that I have sort of comprehensive enough uh, data on parties to, to do this, in, you know, in, in using sort of the full time period. And what you can see is that for most states, um, yes, disfranchisement resulted in an increase in, in electing Democrats in places with more African-Americans. The one exception, Alabama, I think this is less about places with high numbers of African-Americans electing uh, um, uh, fewer Democrats and more about the sort of white hill country that was sort of a real, a real uh, um, uh, focal point of populism sort of after disfranchisement, also electing Democrats. Um, it sort of uh, has that consequence. So that's why we get that sort of negative interaction term there. And then also, this is probably from a from a econometric point of view, ill-advised, but I'm gonna put in uh, that party as a control variable, just to say, see like conditioning on the party that, that a place elects, is there a consequence? Uh, is there still sort of a residual effect uh, uh, on, on roll call voting? So I'm back to the ideal point estimate outcome and exact same model as before, but with sort of Democrat as a control variable. And what you can see, uh, sort of interestingly, Alabama, Mississippi, uh, Tennessee, more or less unchanged. Uh, North Carolina and Virginia, actually like almost positive or, or positive after you sort of take care of that, suggesting that it re that that sort of party replacement is really doing a lot of the work to sort of change or in the case of Virginia, not change roll call voting. Uh, and then even Louisiana actually pops uh, uh, in a negative direction, uh, like some of the other sort of Democrat dominated states after controlling for party. Um, Louisiana has sort of an interesting party dynamic with um, some sort of elite whites being in the Republican Party uh, in the in the pre disfranchisement period too. So it's kind of a, an interesting case. Uh, I do a variety of robustness checks that I'm happy to talk more about in the question and answer period. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the one I'll just highlight is uh, the sort of look testing for parallel trends or, or treatment timing. Um, this is kind of interesting in this case, because on the one hand, in the in the process of data collection, I just sort of had to pick a time period that I was going to say, like, is the start of the treatment period. And then I collected data sort of around that and you know, time consuming. So that sort of that sort of had to come first. So this is an opportunity on the one hand to see uh, if there's sort of potential confounding in, in my results. On the other hand, to see sort of how right I was when I picked the sort of year uh, um, that the sample ought to be constructed around. And what we see 
is uh, I'm sort of uh, right on average, I guess. Some states, it seems like uh, things sort of happen uh, maybe a year earlier uh, than, than I'd indicated. In some states, the effect doesn't sort of come uh, until later. Um, but uh, ultimately, I think that's, um, you know, on the one hand, concerns about causal identification and things like that, which I don't want to make like terrifically strong claims about anyway. Um, but also, I think something that's uh, interesting um, to possibly dig into uh, further as I go forward. Um, variety of other things, including covariates, different types of trends, or even getting rid of the fixed effects, uh, and so on. I'm happy to talk about that uh, going forward. Uh, so what have I uh, hopefully convinced you of? Um, the main thing is that disfranchisement uh, seems to result in roll call voting in some states, certainly that is less in line with African-Americans preferences. So uh, maybe not shocking, but uh, I think important and good to show uh, that yes, when a group is removed from the electorate, you get roll call voting that that is less representative of their interests. Um, and so I think this project and then a, a variety of others to uh, recent um, good work by Keel, Cubson and White that sort of shows uh, um, that in Louisiana specifically, these laws had a consequence for, for uh, um, black voter registration and things like this, a variety of other work by people on this panel, all sort of collectively coming to the conclusion that like, yes, these laws matter um, uh, for, um, and sort of, sort of pushing back on key in that way. Um, a sort of maybe more nuanced, maybe more sort of uh, less formal conclusion, I think, is that even in these Democrat dominated plates, uh, places, excuse me, um, disfranchisement appears to have sort of uh, uh, reduced disagreement among, among Democrats and other parties in the South. Um, appears to have sort of in, in that way maybe consolidated uh, support in the Democratic Party, uh, reduced disagreement, created the Solid South in that way. Um, more generally, outside this sort of very specific, uh, uh, possibly narrow context um, that I'm looking at, I think this project it provides evidence of legislative responsiveness in a, in a pretty tough setting. Um, as I mentioned, this, these were very, you know, sort of not professional legislatures. Um, in a lot of places, it's, it's sort of one party, it's, it's subnational, it's, it's any number of things that might make uh, uh, finding evidence of, of legislative responsiveness a little tougher. Uh, and so the fact that we find it here is maybe sort of um, nice evidence for the sort of expansiveness of, of legislative responsiveness, at least in, in sort of uh, American style political systems. And then finally, I just, I just wanna emphasize um, that even though uh, I'm sort of showing that these formal rules had an impact in um, places that were already dominated by Democrats, that, that these laws were important. You know, one interpretation of that is that fraud and violence and things like that sort of weren't enough to reduce African-American uh, political participation. And while that's true to an extent, I just wanna emphasize that um, the sort of fraud and violence still very clearly produced politics, ideological choices, um, that, that gave African-Americans a limited voice. And so I think, you know, I, I don't, the fact that I'm using the sort of fraud and violence as a, a foil in some sense, I don't want to, to um, diminish its potential importance. And I think that that's something that ought to get more attention in the future. Um, and I'll just wrap up by noting that this is part of a broader, broader research agenda where I'm looking at um, legislative politics more generally, not just role co-voting and the relationship to the franchise using this case of black disfranchisement in the South. So uh, working on a project on sort of legislative influence, things like uh, committee assignment quality, how that sort of changes with black disfranchisement, bill introductions, the sort of legislative effectiveness type things. Uh, I'm having some RAs collect uh, and code sort of bill topics to get sort of a, a sort of policy agendas project type look at, at bill introductions in this time period to see how the legislative agenda changes. And then, you know, sort of once disfranchisement is done, how does legislative politics work in a sort of one party setting like this? Um, so I'll leave it at that, but uh, thank you all so much for being here and thank you for having me. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to David Bateman now from Cornell University to provide uh, Mike with some formal comments. And then we'll uh, entertain any questions from the virtual audience. So while David is providing his formal comments, if anyone has any thoughts, questions, please type them in the chat or Q&A box. Okay, David Bateman. All right, so I just want to start off by saying that this was a wonderful paper. I really enjoyed it. I think the project itself is fantastic. Um, it's hugely important, and I think it's going to sort of really shape and change the way we think about disenfranchisement in the South, in part by sort of confirming some things that uh, we don't know, but sort of there's an intuitiveness to it. But also really, I think, uh, providing 
um, new grounds for recognizing some of the complexities of what was going on. So the contributions, I see them as many and important. And one thing I would just like to say to Michael at the outset is that uh, I think that you understate the importance of the contributions in, in the introduction. I have a bunch of marginal comments that I can sense here uh, sort of uh, uh, later this week, sort of highlighting where I think some points where you could really draw this out. But the way I see it, sort of the major contributions are that one, the continued presence of black voters in the electorate, both their real presence as active voters in some places, and then their latent presence as they could be mobilized, um, uh, had a measurable impact on legislative voting in almost every former Confederate state. And that this impact is very plausibly associated with the representational connection. And I think that that's a profoundly important uh, finding. It reshapes both our understanding of disenfranchisement itself. I think it also uh, can reshape our understanding of this sort of forgotten period of like, from the end of Reconstruction to uh, disenfranchisement, sort of from 1877 or thereabouts up until a form of disenfranchisement, which I think is one of the more interesting, um, uh, generative and uh, less well understood periods in American history. I think this sort of second major contribution is that this disenfranchisement produced not just a wider and more democratic electorate, we kind of got that, right? You, you sort of, you see that in the registration uh, numbers. Uh, I think that there's been a bunch of papers sort of showing that and uh, ooh, that sort of important, but uh, this paper nicely goes well beyond it to show that on balance disenfranch disenfranchisement, uh, and, and Michael's right to call it disfranchisement. Uh, my editors when I tried to publish this would not let me do this. <laughs> but on balance that disfranchisement contributed to a more homogenous voting pattern between a high and low black population areas within the, within legislatures. So that it compressed to a certain extent polarization uh, within state legislatures. And I think that uh, it's also valuable in extending the literature on the impact of voting changes to disenfranchisement sort of, rather than just enfranchisement, which is the primary focus in sort of especially the comparative politics uh, area, which is usually looking at changes to this, um, what happens when people are included in the electorate. Also some national state legislatures rather than electoral shares or policy outcomes or turnout or stuff like this, uh, which tend to be the focus. I actually think that uh, I, I slightly disagree with uh, the, the take of the consensus view being that the franchise matters. I think that there's more varied evidence. And I think that this actually, your, your paper speaks to, well, it does matter and in place for a variety of reasons, which I think might be a bit surprising. And then I just want to applaud the phenomenal data collection effort. Anybody who has worked with state legislative journals and anybody who has tried to scrape state legislative journals will appreciate what Michael has done here. It's really, truly impressive. All right, so I have three general sets of comments that I want, uh, want to develop. One is the question of representation. Okay, but of what? Uh, what is being represented here? Um, two, and sort of more briefly, you know, just want to briefly discuss some of the advantages and limits of the ideal point approach. Uh, I think that there are clear advantages. I wouldn't recommend doing away with it in any way here, and I uh, wouldn't recommend changing much, but understanding the limits of it can help sort of uh, uh, help us better understand what exactly the findings are telling us. And then uh, the last sort of comment was about something that comes up as sort of a tension in the paper that I think uh, is between sort of a desire to tell a story, of, a general story of the South, um, as well as the sort of state specific paths that keep showing up. And one of the things I, want to I would like to encourage you to do either for this paper at some points or for subsequent work is to really start thinking about state specific patterns or even regional specific patterns. And I have a few ideas on that. All right, so I wanna start with the question of, well, the representation of what? And you know, uh, one way into this is sort of thinking about whether this is a hard or easy case to make for the relevance of franchise reform, right? Franchise reform being here, the, uh, this reform. Um, this is in the se some sense sort of the second generation of uh, black disenfranchisement. It's funny that we both use the same pictures. <laughs> I, I, I pulled these up uh, when I was making the slides the other day, um, but they're good pictures, right? Because the first picture shows a certain type of uh, disenfranchisement. It is the disenfranchisement in that you don't get to vote your preference. Uh, you get to, your vote is stolen either by intimidation, coercion, by counting you out, various forms of manipulation. The second is you're not going to cast that vote in, at all. Right? And you know, the second is sort of building on, on the first. And uh, Michael spends a nice time in the paper sort of developing that. So on the one hand, the disenfranchisement of African-Americans in the South uh, is an easy case for the relevance of franchise reform. We should expect to find something because this is a clear case in which sort of affinity groups and class overlap extremely, um, in which the sort of class dimension of conflict is very, very potent. Um, there is very little reason, especially given the 
uh, constellation of class and racism in which we're going to expect that there to be uh, much sort of uh, an equal distribution of preferences across black and white electorates such that it's more homogenous public opinion or anything like that. So on one hand, that should all lead us to think that franchise reform is going to be big. Uh, it's going to have a big impact on the median voters, one way to put it, and there's another way to think about it. On the other hand, it might be a hard case um, in which we shouldn't expect to find much impact. And that's because a lot of the disenfranchisement and a lot of the manipulation had already occurred. And I think this matters for sort of how we interpret the, the representational findings. All right, so uh, Michael frames the findings right throughout the paper as evidence of the representation of black preferences. You know, we, we all kind of sort of try and do this. Everyone who like does historical work at some point tries to do the impossible. Um, but I think it's an especially impossible task at the scale of the South at the turn of the century, right? Before we have any real systematic evidence of black preferences um, across a region, which while homogenous in various ways and homogenous the white, uh, or at least sort of, if not uniform, ubiquitous in the commitment of whites uh, to white supremacy, isn't necessarily a homogenous region. Um, even at the level of white public opinion, let alone at the level of black public opinion. And we just have very little insight into it. Um, uh, Michael acknowledges that this is very tricky and that imputing preferences is, is a tricky business. Um, and I kind of want to sort of push and say, well, I think it's even trickier and that I don't know if you need to do it. Um, and I think that the paper actually holds together better and opens more possibilities when you move away from the question of whether or not rep, rep, preferences are being represented. So uh, can we impute preferences? So. <laughs> it's essential to sort of the interpretation of the findings that black preferences are being represented. And so how do we represent? And so there's three sort of stages in which this sort of might fall apart. It's imputing preferences on the base, imputing electoral preferences, electorate's preferences on the basis of, basis of legislative roll call scaling. So we're trying to map them into the same space and say they anchored, they were on this side of the uh, ideological spectrum, they were on this side of the ideological spectrum. Can we do this when we're more in the left, when we're already in the left figure? Um, in which there's already manipulation going on. And the only real evidence we have for anything is a vote. Um, so there's already manipulation going on. Or where there's less manipulation going on, um, there, in which whites play at least as an important role in defining Republican Party priorities, right? So there's a ton of manipulation going on in Mississippi. You don't elect many, uh, you don't elect many Republicans in Mississippi outside of some highly constrained areas with large black populations. You elect more Republicans in Tennessee and North Carolina, but there's also a greater number of white Republicans and the degree to which they can set the agenda for the party and the priorities of the party is unclear. Right, so um, an assumption of ideological dimension is already problematic in a legislative context, but like then mapping that out to the electorate is especially sort of seems a bit too far. Um, I don't think we have any real good idea. I'm not aware of any uh, good, uh, good work on this about sort of the ideological proximity of white and black Republican voters in biracial coalition states like North Carolina or Tennessee, um, in which case we don't know whether the Republican party in its agenda actually represented primarily, uh, represented equally the preferences of each group or whether uh, African-American voters were sort of stuck with the Republican party or whether just as likely all, all electoral groups, all electoral blocks had various types of patronage, clientelistic relationships with particular parties in which organizations of getting people out to vote involved sort of what was the local sort of power structure in a particular place. Um, and then the, in, in black majority states, the Republicans there often reflected skewed class interests or very locally expedient compromises. Um, so uh, an example um, that I think Woodward would, would highlight about sort of allying with the conservative Democrats would be uh, Robert Smalls, who's fantastically interesting, uh, African-American re Republican from South Carolina, he endorses the Democratic candidate against Tillman, not because he likes a Democratic candidate, but because he really hates Tillman. <laughs> um, other contexts, the fusion is we will endorse the Democratic candidate for the, the uh, congressional office, and uh, they will allow sort of a black local officials, the Democrats will allow black Republican local officials in like those are highly black majority areas, right? So different types of fusions. And so none of these are really about sort of preferences, but they're all very expedient, compromised, hard choices. And then there's sort of the, the, the uh, skewed class interests here as well, um, right? There, like, there were African-Americans in favor of some level of disenfranchisement precisely because they felt that the vast majority of black voters shouldn't be voting. There were internal differences amongst them. All right, so the findings are compatible with pretty different pre-disenfranchisement black electorate preferences had to be consulted. I think that that's like the most straightforward in some ways, and that's plausible. And I think that that uh, would be a great thing to find. However, it really opens up more questions, right? On all issues, 
On symbolic or clientelistic issues, on redistributive issues, seems unlikely. On regulatory issues, maybe. Uh, another possibility is that pre disenfranchisement, Black electorate provided, <laughs> as in had stolen from them, votes for a faction of white Democrats. And so what disenfranchisement does isn't remove Black preferences from the electorate, but rather removes a tool by which one faction of white Democrats had been able to use Black votes in contradiction to their preferences against another faction of white Democrats. Uh, you know, the plan to paternalism of which sort of uh, Woodward makes some, 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 some deal of, at least part of it, why the Wade Hampton type of alliance comes easier is not primarily, it's not exclusively that uh, it's the agrarians calling for Jim Crow, which depends on what type of Jim Crow law, but rather that there is no choice. <laughs> they, are in, they are the dominant forces in their communities. Um, this was a regular complaint of both white agrarians as well as black organizations and commentators that this is exactly what planters were doing. Um, even the treatment assumption that like the treatment happens in that legislature, the legislature that disenfranchises. It seems more in line with a factionalism story in which the faction has already won. Uh, and that is when they're able to sort of uh, achieve what they want. In any case, some, I think that the implications here in some way diametrically opposed but are empirically indistinguishable. Uh, so what do we do with that? There's a few possibilities. One, we could sort of try and ascribe a generic black preference either on the basis of substantive policy disputes, but this would have to go beyond sort of issues of concern of near exclusive concern to blacks, right? So this would have to say, um, in which it's going to sort of separate blacks from whites primarily. It does mean eventually you'd have to wade into the interpretive debates on populism. I think that that's going to have to go beyond sort of uh, a few sites to Woodward's or others, right? Because the, the interpretive debates of populism are not just about whether or not white populists were racist, but whether, despite the racism, they and blacks shared policy preferences. And because we can't ascribe black preferences and priorities right, on the basis of uh, the ultimate politics that played out, the debate is of interpreting what classes saw as a higher or lower priority. Um, okay, so all this is to say, and I want to wrap up, I don't think preferences are needed. Uh, the top line finding I don't think is the awesome power of the franchise enforcing representation of preferences, but rather the degree to which even the prospect of the voting shaped legislative politics, regardless of what pathway it occurred through. Um, and I think actually that opens up to the, one of the sort of final things I want to talk about, which is that that pathway is going to be uh, different by states or potentially different by state, which opens up a story, a common story of disenfranchisement matter for legislative representation, but potentially in different ways. Uh, all right, so modeling choices, advantages of ideal points. Yeah, I mean, this is all stuff you know, so I don't want to go too much on it. On it. The disadvantages, right? Especially when parties are present, it becomes a Rorschach test. Um, and there's no way to isolate preferences, even though that's what we all want them to do. Uh, the bridging assumptions sometimes contradict assumptions in the key questions, right? Uh, your theoretical setup assumes a type of uh, anticipatory responsiveness in the electoral connection that your modeling choices don't allow you to do. That's probably not a big issue because how few people serve for like how few people are bridging. Um, it might, it will mute differences, however, right? So the decline in APR after this enfranchisement might be higher without it. I'm interested in sort of just in more discussion about that, anyways. And none of it really accounts for any changing substantive agenda. Um, I don't think it's a big deal, big deal. Um, all right, I'm gonna wrap up here because I've already gone too long. Uh, but I, I think that one of the sort of the most interesting uh, potentials of this paper that's already there, could be drawn a little bit more and I have some ideas of how, is to uh, separate out general stories of the South versus the distinctive stories of each state, right? So what are the common findings? Well, I think probably the most uh, the most obvious common finding is the probability of electing a Democrat increases everywhere after disenfranchisement in high black population areas. It's not a big part of the paper, but it's I think it's pretty, like, it's pretty compelling. I think it's compatible with the Sheer Sink and Jenkins finding about uh, the impact of disenfranchisement leading to more Republican voting. I think it is, uh, but that'd be worth sort of looking at. Um, at but clearly the big takeaway is that in most states, consequence of disenfranchisement, disenfranch that there is a consequence of disenfranchisement on legislative voting. Everywhere black percentage matter for legislative voting, which is really kind of surprising. Like I think it should matter for turnout. <laughs> I think it should matter for like whether you're not like a Democrat. I don't, it's like not intuitive to me that it would matter for legislative voting. And yet it seems to. So I'm quite impressed by that. Uh, more than the presented literate or the policy variant. But then there were these regional subpatterns, right? And I think that this matters because that they are not unrelated, unrelated to the possibility of different paths here. So looking at this figure and a few others, right? I was able to, I was thinking about the like a few common patterns. Right? So there's the Alabama alone pattern in which the change seems to be driven by white districts um, and it's a decrease in polarization that results, right? There's a flattening of the line post disenfranchisement. And there's a, a second pattern of not much change, right? Louisiana, Virginia, Georgia, like it's there maybe, but like it doesn't like, it doesn't show up, it's not striking. Um, and then there's this third pattern of change in black districts decreases polarization between low and high black population areas. 
And then a fourth one of change in black districts. Uh, so the change occurs there, right? So it's representatives from black districts that move, and that results in an increased pattern of polarization. And I, I thought it was a bit interesting, at least, that uh, that really this maps on very closely to the Deep South versus North Carolina and Tennessee, which have their own sort of very distinctive types of politics, um, given the sort of strength of white Republicanism there, versus these no change states. And so I was wondering whether there's these regional patterns that might uh, that might be drawn out here. All right, uh, where to go? Not for this paper, because I think this paper is basically has almost everything it needs, and so should be sent out. Um, I, I think that in the future project, I would love to see you developing these state-specific stories. Um, I was glad to see that you're doing this policy agendas project. I would love to examine the role call agenda for issues of substantive importance. That's a mess because of like, God, that's a mess. Um, but any sort of even randomly selecting votes to look at what the distribution of policy issues is like before and after. And then use these sources of data to connect with some of the other literatures. And one in particular that I was thinking of was sort of this class and regime resilience. Is it the same regime in 76 as in 96? Uh, is it the same sort of planter class that per persists throughout this at the le level of the le state legislature and at the level maybe of state legislative ideal points and the le level of state legislative priorities? All right, thank you very much. And my apologies for going on a little long. No, uh, not a problem, David, thank you. Uh... Mike, uh, before we entertain questions, any any responses at all? Any thoughts from what David uh, had? Um, well, for, just thank you so much, David, for like such a thoughtful read and, and so many good comments. I, I think I agree with everything that you said. <laughs> um, and in particular, I, like particularly thinking about the um, the mapping of preferences uh, um, uh, from, or the, yeah, the mapping of black preferences essentially onto these ideal point estimates. I, I really appreciate your comments there, both because I think um, <laughs> you've suggested that I don't have to do the thing that I've been struggling the most with <laughs> in some sense, because the more, the more uh, books I looked at, the more confusing uh, um, it got in sort of these places where it's, it's populists versus Democrats. And so uh, I think I agree with you that, that it doesn't have to be sort of explicitly like uh, um, disfranchisement made things worse very specifically for African Americans, um, and and so and I and I think too I need to um, uh, I've I've worked towards selling the paper as being about sort of African Americans having political voice beforehand, but I think the fact that that restructuring that a little bit would allow me to. Um, uh, acknowledge that in some of these places, this isn't so much African-Americans exerting political voice as it is them having their votes stolen for, or, or at least potentially having their votes stolen on behalf of some group, I think is, um, uh, yeah, important to acknowledge. And so I um, no, I, I think this is terrifically helpful and I, I really appreciate it. So we have some questions. I thought maybe I would just ask an informational question first. So, you know, as, David kind of alludes to this a little bit, but could you tell us a little bit about what the um, state legislative records actually look like for these 10 states? Um, you were able to scrape the votes. Uh, at least right now, you don't have a code book for the votes. Is that that's right? right. Yeah, that's it's, right. And it's easier versus harder to do that in some states to put that together? Yeah, yeah that's right. So, so in some states, um, uh, yeah. So first, the journals are very much just like, a record of things that were done. There aren't really speeches. There aren't there aren't things like that. It's sort of like, next we vote on this, and here's the vote. Sometimes here's the vote. <laughs> um, more often than not, you know, and it passed <laughs> uh, or something like that. Um, uh, but yeah, as as far as um, thinking about developing a code book for some states, uh, I won't call it impossible, but I, I will say, you know to the extent that there's information on specific bills, it's sort of buried throughout the journal text. Um, so the states that I'm focusing on, on trying to develop a code book for, or, or get this sort of comprehensive information on bills for, um, are, are the very nice ones where they put together a table <laughs> in the back that was sort of like here, here, you know, bill one through 400 and here's each bill sponsor and here's a short title. And I mean, you had ten Tennessee and Louisiana are really uniquely good at this where they, they put sort of like the pages that it passes, you know, first, third, second, third reading and things like that. Um, so for those states, you know, still tedious, but, but fairly doable. Um, and so, but yes, right now the, um, I have uh, taken the step of finding the page that each journal or that each um, uh, 
roll call vote is on like that, that I can sort of back out from, from the scraping. And so that should facilitate developing a code book because you can sort of go hunt down a particular, particular vote. And that was used to, um, to clean the votes and sort of compare the, the yay and nay total from the scraping to the one reported in the journal. Um, but uh, yeah, no code book yet. If you were actually the, I mean, you have so many votes across so many years of these states. Um, do you have any, any kind of in, intuitive sense of how many of them were really lopsided versus pretty close? I mean, were, were a lot of the votes fairly contentious? Yeah, uh, I think um, it, it varies a lot from place to place. Uh, um, you know, South Carolina is sort of interesting because it is like all de all Democrats, but like very clear factions of Democrats. Um, um, South Carolina, in a few of these sessions, it's like a lot of 50-50 votes. Um, like um, even the votes on on like um, uh, passing the first like Jim Crow separate coach law is like, I, th I think at least one of the votes in the process was tied. Uh, um, so it's like um, there it can be really contentious by the time like um, Virginia, North Carolina, by the sort of end of this time period, it's just all very close to unanimous uh, uh, and just a few sort of votes that are that are just, uh, sort of actually useful in the roll call scaling. Okay, so uh, my, my graduate student Nico had a question and then he had to leave at one o'clock, but he, he left it in the Q&A box and it was just talking a little bit about maybe some of the, you know, maybe uh, an overlap of some things that David and I mentioned, mm -hmm. right? to the extent that you could actually back out some of the, the policy areas for the votes. Uh, you know, how well does a basic model, would a basic model explain those yeah. votes and how much variation would there be? Do you have any sense of that? Yeah, um, not really, <laughs> to be honest. I would like, I think it's a, a very good question and one that I would like to, to like, yeah, one, one thing that I would very much like to do is be able to sort of split out by sort of policy agendas, project code, scale those differently and just see how they all correlate with, with the sort of aggregate score. Like, I think that would be terrifically useful to actually know what's, um, what's going on here. Um, what I can say is I've, I've looked at these separate coach votes a few times, but they're sort of um, as just an example of something that's like really clearly, uh, you know, they're really sort of the only overt segregation votes and they're not even in most states. Usually it's unanimous, just sort of a unanimous voice vote. Um, and in South Carolina, it more or less lines up how you'd expect in some of these other states, it's actually the reverse because like for a particular session, the sort of uh, like Arkansas is a good example where like, the agricultural wheelers for a session like voted a lot with the sort of black Republicans uh, in the legislature as sort of a anti-Democrat coalition. And so they're the sort of like opponents, even though they're on the sort of like more populist end of the spectrum. So this is why I really uh, don't want to take like terrifically strong stances about which end sort of corresponds to, to black preferences super clearly. But that's the sort of one um, thing that I've tried to explore. Uh, it, but a lot of these, um, a lot of votes that I think would uh, seem to obviously map onto African American preference, like you know, things that are overtly about segregation or things like that, are um, just voice votes. Like they're not especially contentious. And things that we sort of know today to be uh, uh, racialized, things like criminal justice and things like that, are also really. Uh, they're tough in this time period to be like, I mean, like, I don't know, I don't know what passing an appropriation for a like black segregated hospital means. Like, I don't know how that maps onto African-American preferences because it's like it's a hospital for African-Americans, which seems good, but it's also a hospital for African-Americans, which seems bad. Um, anyway, that was a long answer, but. Uh, and very likely underfunded relative. Yeah, of course. That's, ones, that's right. right. So. Uh, David, did you have something on this point? Yeah, I just wanted to jump in on this point because uh, one, one possibility that came to me uh, was when I was thinking about, you know, the, the difficulties of comparing across states, which I think is totally fine, is probably impossible to do in this context, uh, um, was uh, votes on federal issues. So st southern states were especially likely to uh, instruct or to instruct the representatives or request yeah. the senators um, to do something. And so they did this with uh, the Blair bill, which uh, I know yeah. Jeff has an interest in, I have an interest in, and I think would be really, really interesting here. 
Um, I also think the Blair Bill would be a great one, uh, great sort of thing to look at precisely because, you know, we know that like for the, exactly the, the patterns you describe of like an issue on lynching, you know, you're not going to get that like, much, you're not going to get that many recorded votes on it and it's not going to separate out that many people uh, or like segregated um, cars or something like that. But the Blair Bill will and, and black preference, like we can much more regularly, like just in the same way that we can ascribe a preference to uh, black voters on lynching, it's pretty safe given the rates of literacy and given the importance of that for all different classes of the, the black community in the South at the time, that the Blair Bill would be very likely, we can ascribe that preference with a minimal of assumptions. Yeah. So those that's types a, of issues. That's a great idea. Thanks. So uh, Jeff Chanson writes in, uh, David Bateman raises an interesting point. County black population share is treated linearly. But in very high black share counties, around 65% or so, perhaps intimidation fraud is less effective. So formal disenfranchisement oh, sure. might be very effective in those counties, but not much effect in say 40 to 55% share counties where fraud violence, the counties would be electorally competitive. So there, there may be some nonlinear effects there to, to think about. Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, I'll, this isn't, I, I think the, the sort of theoretical point that's raised there is, is a really good one um, and, and worth thinking about in more detail. Can you see those, those slides? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, so I, I'll just show, you know, I did sort of the uh, binned marginal effects plots. You can sort of interrogate how, how well the, the linearity assumption works. So like the, the um, right, the linear fit here is essentially the, the coefficient that I plotted. You know, these are, these models don't have fixed effects, but they're, they're close. Um, and, and you can sort of see that these bins, when you just split it up into the terciles or whatever, like the linearity assumption looks like pretty good. Uh, you know, not not perfect everywhere. You know, Florida. This would seem to maybe suggest something along the lines of 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 what he indicated. You know, it's a little flatter between these first two bins, and then a real drop off in the in the others. But by the same token, in a place like Florida, these are the places that would have been electing Republicans. So, um, uh, yeah. I mean, I'll just scroll through these kind of slowly. But the, the the short version is that linearity seems to do like a pretty good job. But I think that's it, you know it's. A strong assumption for sure. So where are you planning to go next with this project? I know you talked about future plans. What is the what is in the very near future? Yeah, the very near future involves actually finally submitting this to a journal, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, um, which uh, has taken, again, like I said, longer than I than I'd care to admit. Um, but I think um, after that, uh, ultimately, I don't have a terrifically firm timeline, but but I think one way to allow allow myself to dig into these state specific trends that that David alluded to is to, is to put it in a longer form a book form um, and think about on sort of a state by state you know I don't necessarily want to do a the first half of VO key where every state gets its own <laughs> kind of long chapter but because uh, um, I know my students always skip them uh, <laughs> um, but but something like that that would allow for a little more nuance I mean just digging into some of these patterns that I, I mean, I don't honestly yet have terrific explanations for, but I think, you know, things like the fact that, you know, you sort of see an effect in Louisiana once you control for party, like that seems important. And, and in Louisiana in particular, things seem like quite different in Orleans Parish and outside Orleans Parish. Um, and the politics in that state is such that that kind of makes sense, but there's no room to pay for it um, and things like that. Um, so, I, yeah, I think the, the hope is to bring together some of these different types of data, the agenda data, the the committee data and, and think about this in a slightly more comprehensive, detailed way. Okay, any any further questions from the, the world outside, the Zoom world? Anything, David, anything more that you want to comment on or ask? What, what are you working on these days? Are you working on a project similar to this? Uh, not, uh, not on this, I haven't been doing much in the South, um, although I've been doing some uh, and I'm like a year behind on something. <laughs> So <laughs> just just a year. <laughs> I'm a pandemic behind. It's like how I like it. <laughs> a, and there's a pandemic hurdle. Uh, but um, I, I just wanted to follow, uh, uh, encourage my vote uh, to do the book route. Um, I think that there's a real opportunity here. I think one of the reasons that you're going to find uh, with the populist literature, for instance, like it just ends up being such radically different interpretations, is that so much of it ends up being like very localized. Oh. And getting a picture of the whole that is both a picture of the whole, but like attentive to sort of state patterns sure. 
um, is tough. And then, you know, that's what Kusar tries to do, the key tries to do it. But we don't have anything like that for state legislative politics. We have uh, Hirsink and, and Jenkins for the Republican Party. Um, we, but like, there's not much beyond that, like at the state level that's been done in the last sort of several years that I know. Is that right? I think that's right, yeah. And like, I think that that's why we have such these sort of radically different interpretations of it, is that uh, this interpretation works in this part of Texas, this interpretation works in Louisiana, this interpretation is in North Carolina. Um, and they're each sort of distinct, even though they have the, the basic common pattern of disenfranchisement matters. Uh, and how you get there and like the pathway out of it sort of might be different, but everywhere that it passes, it, it like it changes legislative voting. That's that's a tough one to change, I think. Um, yeah. I don't think we take it for like I think we take for granted that it would, but it's it's tough. Some of the questions that I have kind of are, you know, at, at odds with the estimation, right? Uh, given that you're kind of estimating a single ideal point for all the members. You know, and again, if I could wave my hand, some of the some of the questions that I would be interested in, you know, interrogating would be, as the individual states started to uh, adopt some of these disenfranchisement laws, did that did those effects bleed over into states, you know, especially contiguous states um, that had not yet adopted those laws? So, do we see, you know, if if you know. Tennessee and Mississippi are the first movers on some of these. Um, and that affects how, you know, black citizens are being represented in those states. Uh, do legislators in neighboring states begin to change their behavior even before those states adopt uh, similar laws? Uh, do we see black participation begin to drop in those states, those contiguous states? Uh, before you have formal laws passed, um, you know, and again, this is this, this is a very much a dynamic story, right? So yeah. you would you would need to have, you know, legislative session ideal points. You would need to have very good, you know, data on turnout uh, by race, by state, by year, I suppose, right? Um, but, you know, I've, you know, it, it always, you know, the story that you read, like in Kauser and Perman, and Inver, you know, it becomes these sort of, you know, one by one dominoes that, yep. that kind of turn over across a couple of decades. And what's left un, unanalyzed is, you know, what kind of behavior is actually going on within those states during that time period, within that period in which you have these 11 states kind of start to shift. Um, you know, do you, do you, you know, and again, this goes to some of David's comments, do you see, you know, re Republican leaders, for example, um, start to try to negotiate to prevent those laws from actually being adopted in some neighboring states, right? I know, for example, in Tennessee, um, this, this never fully happens, right? Republicans in the, the western part of the state, western part? Eastern, eastern part, I can never remember. Uh, uh, you know, Republican voting continues yeah. uh, throughout this period, right? And and those Republican votes are used just, just as in the, the general story that you're telling, right? Oftentimes they're allowed to continue because they're gonna be the pivotal votes between two democratic factions, right? So they're bidding on those voters. And those factions can never quite um, agree uh, to eliminate them. You know, that begs the question, if, if Republican votes were actually the pivotal votes in the other states, uh, what had to happen necessarily to actually eliminate those votes? Apparently one coalition had to uh, take control of both chambers of the state legislature and the governorship or something like that in order to eliminate them. That might be kind of an interesting question to examine. Um, and, you know, it would be it would be a really interesting question is if, if you know, that unified control actually occurred because of the Republican votes themselves, right? <laughs> if that coalition actually became the unified control in the, in the state, and then they eliminated, you know, that segment of their voting coalition. So the other, you know, the other group couldn't potentially bid them away in the next election. Sure. Um, 
But again, this is this is me waving my hands at what is a lot of work over a long period of time, right? By a lot of people probably to be able to answer those things. Um, but I guess uh, you know, circling back, this comes back to David's point. We don't really know a lot about the the really inner workings of what's going on here, uh, aside from you know, kind of stories that, that Key and Perman tell, which may in fact be true a lot of the time, but are, are kind of sweeping in their generality a lot of the time. Yeah, that's right. So, so there's no question in there. <laughs> oh, no. It's just me filling time, it seems. Uh, but, uh, you know, I don't have anything more, more to, to add other than to say, you know, I think this project like David is, is really cool, right? And a colleague of mine here at the Price School had asked me uh, a week or two ago, uh, you know, whether we had systematic data at the state level going back to around this time. And, you know, I said, we really didn't, right? Other than people kind of cobbling together some. Yeah. And he was surprised that we, you know, that people hadn't come in, that some quote, enterprising graduate, graduate student didn't come in and collect all this data. And you're here to, to tell us it's really hard, right? It's really hard, it's really time consuming. Um, it's incomplete in the sense that, you know, it's, you know, it, you know, the difficulty is by state and, you know, you gotta, you gotta fight the books by state as to what you can actually get out of them. And if you actually wanna try to get a code book, that's really hard. Um, you know, history is not kind to people who wanna study state politics, state and local politics, right? I mean, it just isn't, um, so. Uh, it doesn't look like we have any more questions. Uh, David, anything more that you want to No, I guess I, I will uh, sort of clean up my marginal comments, um, sort of get them all in, in an order and send you those by the end of the week. Uh, the Thank paper's you. really excellent. Uh, I, I agree with Jeff that, you know, if you could get dynamic scores, that'd be nice, but I don't actually think that, I, I don't think it's necessary for this cut uh, because of how few, sort of, how, how short their terms are. For this cut, this is great. I agree. Okay. Great. Well, I, I, uh, yeah, I can't thank you all enough for the comments and thoughts. Uh, yeah, I mean, this both gives me a lot to think about, and and I think will really help me tighten this up. So I, I I'm immensely grateful. Okay. So I will I will gavel this workshop to a close. Uh, thanks very much, David Bateman, for providing some comments and and your time today. Thanks to Michael Olson, who uh, also presented a, a great paper that. Uh, should be sent out soon, right? I want to encourage you to get this out into the world soon. Uh, and thanks to everyone out there in the Zoom world. Uh, thanks to Aubrey Hicks and Ann Johnson from the Pedrosian Center for helping me hold these things as you always do. And we'll see you again in, I guess, four weeks when Anna Harvey will present. Uh, two weeks from now, we have a political polarization symposium. So uh, until then, uh, have a good rest of your Monday and we'll see you soon.